This is Harvey Milk speaking from my camera store on the evening of Friday, November 18th. This is tape number two. I've already taped one according to this, so there'll be variations between the tapes because um, I'm not doing this for many notes or anything else, just some thoughts. This is to be played only in the event of my death by assassination. Um, I've given some strong and long and considerable thought to this, not just since the election. I've been thinking of this for some time prior to the election and certainly over the years. I've fully realized that um, a person... Uh, who stands for what I stand for, an activist, gay activist, becomes the target or the potential target for somebody who is insecure, terrified, afraid, or very disturbed themselves. And knowing that uh, I could be assassinated at any moment, or any time, I feel it's important that some people know my thoughts. Uh, and so, the following of my thoughts, my wishes, my desires, whatever. And uh, I'd like to pass them on and have them played for the appropriate people. The first and most obvious and most concerned is that if I was to be shot and killed, the mayor has the power, it's George Moscone, of appointing my successor on the Board of Supervisors. I know that there will be great pressures on him and lobbying on him from various factors, and so I would like to have him know what my thoughts are. I stood for more than just a candidate. I think there was a strong differential between somebody like Rick Stokes and myself. I have never considered myself a candidate. I have always considered myself part of a movement, part of a candidacy. I considered the movement as a candidate. I think there's a delineation of those who use the movement and those who are part of the movement. And I think I was part of the gay movement. And I think that... Uh, I wish I had time to explain everything I did. Almost everything was done in the eyes of the gay movement. And I would suggest and urge and hope that the mayor would understand that distinction and that he would appoint to somebody, somebody to my position who also came from the movement rather than used the movement or never understood the movement. I think those people who actively opposed me, the Stokeses, the Forsters, the Joe Daly's, Doug D. Young's, those people never understood the movement. I'm not saying they were against it, they just never understood it. They used it, maybe willingly, maybe unwillingly, but they never understood what it was about. I think those who remained in silence, the Frank Fitches, not wishing to play sides, never understood the movement. Never understood that silence sometimes is worse than speaking out. And so I would hope that the mayor would understand that appointing somebody who actively opposed me or subtly opposed me or kept quiet all through it, stuck their head in the sand, would be an insult to everything I stood for. Would be an affront to the campaigns and the people who worked. And I would hope he would then give strong consideration and only strong consideration to people who came from the movement. And I've talked about this with several people and they know my thoughts. And just put them on tape so that there's no doubt in anybody's mind of my thoughts. And there are some people I definitely have in mind who I would like the mayor to consider. The first choice I would have was 
gentleman by the name of Frank Robinson, who's quite an author in his own right. Frank, even more so, knows my thought processes. Not only has he read everything I've written and helped rewrite the, the, the major pieces, but Frank is the one who almost daily we had conversations on issues and points and philosophies. And so he knows my thinking as well. He understands how I arrived at decisions and he played devil's advocate time and time again. And so if there's anybody who knows me from the depth of the intellect and the emotions, it is Frank Robinson. And I think being who he is, he certainly has that incredible ability to express himself clearly, concisely, and without any any problems. And I think he would certainly be able to carry on the philosophy and the idea of what I stood for. But for some reason, Frank is not the choice. The next consideration I would hope the mayor would give to would be to Bob Ross. Bob has read everything I've written for the last four years and also and many times has carried on extensive dialogues with me. He also has that quality of getting along with a lot more people than I can, which is going to be needed. And Bob is a strong person who will not bend, and that's vital. We cannot have somebody made out of tissue paper. We cannot have a weak person. We cannot have the Rick Stokes types the professional lawyers. Gay people, the first few gay people must be strong. That doesn't mean obstinate or uncompromising, but must be strong. The third choice I would have would be Harry Britt, who most people don't know, but I've watched Harry, and Harry's been in three, involved with three campaigns, and Harry knows where I am, and I've watched Harry grow and grow and grow and become more articulate and more articulate and some people may find him wrong because he is somewhat emotional but by God, what fabulous emotions. And a very, very dedicated and strong person. One who will not be pushed around. One who understands where the movement is and where it must go. And someday we'll be there anyhow. And a fourth possibility is a person who is younger, newer, and learning every day. That's the woman who put my campaign together in Cronenberg, who is strong, who understands and, as I said, learns fast, and that's vital. It would add a spirit, being a gay woman, that the others cannot add. And I think that would be an outstanding choice. And I hope the mayor would understand that in the cases like this, the tradition has been to replace a person who has been assassinated with somebody who is close to the candidate on thought rather than somebody who actively or quietly opposed the candidate. And it's important that that happens. I cannot urge the mayor strongly enough to know what I'm saying. And I think that if he did that, he'd be gaining a tremendous amount of support. The other aspect of this tape is the obvious is what should happen if there is an assassination, and that is, can I prevent some people from getting angry and frustrated and mad, but I hope they would take that anger and frustration and madness instead of demonstrating or anything of that type, I would hope they take it to positive, and I would hope five, ten, a hundred thousand would rise. I'd love to see every gay doctor come out. I'd love to see every gay lawyer, every gay judge, every gay bureaucrat, every gay architect come out. Stand up. Let the world know. 
that would do more to end prejudice overnight than anybody could have imagined. Urge them to do that. Urge them. Come out. It's only that way will we start to achieve our rights. And I hope there's no religious services, whatever. My God, first of all, I'd hope there'd be no services of any kind whatsoever, but I know some people are into that, and you can't prevent it from happening if they want to happen. But by God, nothing religious. I mean, until the churches break out and say the Anita Bryans have been playing gymnastics with the Bible into the church, churches which remain so quiet have the guts to get out and speak out in the name of Christianity or Judaism or whatever they profess on paper and in words, but do not in actions and deeds. Until those churches speak out, God, and that's the irony of it, God. Churches don't even know what it's about. I would verbally turn over in my grave if there was any kind of religious ceremony. And it's not as a disbelief in God, it's a disbelief for disgust of what most churches are about. How many leaders got up and spoke from the pulpits and went to Miami and said, Anita, you're playing gymnastics with the Bible. You're desecrating the Bible. How many of them said it? How many of them hid and walked away? Ducked their heads in the name of Christianity. Talked about love and brotherhood. No, no services whatsoever. If anything, maybe just play that tape to Briggs and I, which is somewhere in the cabinet in the back, the file cabinet. Just play that tape to Briggs and I over and over again so people know what an evil man he is. So people know what our Hitler is like. People know where the seeds of hate come from. So the people know what the future is going to bring if they're not careful. And that's all I ask. That's all. I ask for a movement to continue, for a movement to grow. Because last week I got that phone call from Altoona, Pennsylvania. And my election gave somebody else, one more person, hope. And after all, that's what it's about. It's not about personal gain. not about ego. not about power. It's about giving those young people out there in Altoona, Pennsylvania's hope. You gotta give them hope.